in San County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, he says, No living man will see again the long grass prairie, where a sea of prairie flowers lapped at the stirrups of the pioneer. There were a hundred such plants, many of exceptional beauty. Most of them were quite unknown to those who have inherited their domain. This is the first in a series of films that will help you to come to know and perhaps appreciate some of the flowers and grasses of what once was the prairie. The first plant of the dry prairie we shall study is lead plant amorpha. It is a woody plant and therefore a shrub. If allowed to grow undisturbed, it can reach heights of four feet tall, but two and a half feet is more common. The name lead plant perhaps comes from the lead gray color of the leaves. This color is not uncommon among prairie plants, for it has a reflective quality which helps sustain the plant during hot summer days. Lead plant amorpha, or amorpha canescens, is a legume. Legumes are capable of converting soil nutrients into available nitrogen for use by other plants. Legumes also have several visual characteristics, such as compound leaves. Lead plant amorpha has pinnately compound leaves, which include many leaflets arranged feather-like along the stem. Also, most legumes produce flowers that are pea flower shaped. Lead plant has many such blue flowers that are small and in tight clusters along the stem. These flowers later produce tiny pods. Pods are also typical of most legumes. Another common prairie forb is candle anemone or long-headed thimbleweed. This plant is easily identified by the thimble-like seed head that persists all summer long and then becomes a cotton seed fluff in the fall. The wire-like stems branch from a whorl of five to nine leaves halfway up the plant. Candle anemone, or anemone cylindrica, blooms early between May and July. The flower is five-sepaled and greenish-white, and the solitary flower occurs on a long, thin stem one to two feet tall. There are some plants in the prairie that are attractive because of foliage rather than bloom. One such plant is Louisiana sage, Artemisia ludoviciana. The leaves of the Louisiana or silver sage are densely covered with a white fuzz that gives the silver appearance. In fact, the whole plant takes on this silver or whitened color. It grows one and a half to three feet tall and provides a good color contrast in both summer and fall. The prairie is a very complex environment and most annual plants are not competitive enough to survive. However, the milkweeds are capable of occupying any disturbed area such as a badger digging or where man has intervened. The most common is no stranger to the farmer, the common milkweed, or Asclepius syriaca. This plant has very thick leaves that are arranged in an opposite fashion on either side of the stem. The flowers bloom pink to lavender in ball-like clusters at the end of the stem or in the axils of the leaves. Only a few of the flowers develop into pods, but each pod produces many fluffy seeds that are easily dispersed by late summer breezes. This is a field of whorled milkweed. It too is an annual and a prairie invader of disturbed sites. It grows one to two feet tall and gets its name whorled milkweed from its narrow linear leaves that occur in whorls of two to four at each node of the stem. The flowers bloom white in tight clusters from June to September and then produce pods that are narrow and stand upright on the stem. These pods also turn brown and produce windblown seeds. World milkweed's scientific name is Asclepius verticillata. One of the showiest groups of upland forbs 
is the asters. The aster is a member of the composite family, or more than one flower per blossom. The clusters are tightly packed disc flowers, and their radiating fringes are colorful strap-shaped ray flowers. Most asters come into bloom late in the season, September to November. They bloom in many colors. Two asters common to the upland prairie are heath aster and silky aster. The heath aster, or aster ericoides, always blooms white and is one of the smallest asters, less than 12 inches tall. Silky aster, or aster cerisius, blooms a pale blue, and the blossoms are supported by very thin wire-like stems, giving it a delicate or fragile appearance. When the asters come into bloom, it is a very special time to visit the prairie. Let's take a moment and review the first group of forbs and one shrub of the upland prairie. The first shrub, lead plant amorpha, or amorpha canescens. Next, candle anemone, or anemone cylindrica. followed by two milkweeds, common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca, and world milkweed, Asclepius verticillata. Then the asters, heath aster, aster ericoides, and silky aster, aster cerisius. The most unusual group of plants are the indigos. They are also legumes, growing two to four feet tall and appearing to rest upon other forbs and midgrasses for support. This particular plant is Atlantic wild indigo, or Baptisia leucantha. The foliage is smooth on ascending branches. The leaves are compound and divided into three leaflets. The flower which blooms between May and June is white and pea-like. The individual flowers, about an inch in length, attract bumblebees and are arranged in loose clusters up to 12 inches in length. The inflated pods, which later develop, are also about an inch in size. They mature to a black indigo color. The plains wild indigo, or Baptisia leucophia, is similar to Atlantic wild indigo. The flowers, however, bloom yellow and do not stand upright, but tend to grow low and drooping at one to three feet tall. About midsummer, the upland prairie will suddenly bloom yellow. 
This new color will usually be the product of a rather small, delicate annual called the showy partridge pea. It too is a legume. The pea-like flower is yellow with purple anthers. The leaves are pinnately compound with 8 to 15 pairs of leaflets which fold to a closed position at night. The showy partridge pea or Cassia fasciculata also produces small flat pods that twist upon ripening and throw seeds several feet from the plant. It has proven to be an excellent forage crop and has been used extensively throughout the Midwest pastures and roadside plantings. Most farmers and county weed control officers will recognize our next plant, the thistle. It comes in many forms, some of which can become real pests along roadsides and abandoned farmland. However, the prairie, being a tight-knit community, seldom has a very large population of this very stickery plant. It is an annual invader of disturbed sites which produce windblown seeds in abundance. The goldfinch, the state bird of Iowa, will not nest until thistle time and loads its nest with the soft down seeds of this plant. Most thistles, or Circium species, bloom lavender or purple, and some are very showy like this native prairie thistle. Along about June and most of what we call early summer, our next plant makes its presence known in a soft lavender way. The pale purple coneflower, or Echinacea pallida, has come into bloom, looking very much like a rather purple daisy. This slender stalked beauty appears at first glance to have no leaves, but with closer investigation we find them on the lower stem, long and narrow, and like the rest of the plant, grisly hairy. The stem and bristly seed head will turn brown in winter and remain standing until next year's crop. Next is one of the most beautiful of all flowers, the downy gentian or gentiana puberula. This plant holds to the old adage, the best are last, for it blooms late, August to November. The downy gentian has a minutely fine down on stem and leaves. The leaves are lance-shaped and opposite along the stem. The flowers are a violet blue with a funnel-shaped corolla that appears to be twisted. The gentians are not a huge splash of color in the prairie, but instead are the hidden treasures that speak to the most observant and to the poets of our society. Now blossoms bright with autumn dew and colored with the heaven's own blue that opens when the quiet light succeeds the keen and frosty night. It's time again for a review in this second grouping of upland prairie forbs. First, the indigos, Atlantic wild indigo, or Baptisia leucantha.
and the plains wild indigo, Baptisia leucophia. Then showy partridge pea, or Cassia fasciculata. And the thistles or Circium species. Pale Echinacea or pale purple coneflower, or Echinacea pallida. And again, downy gentian, or gentiana puberula. Our next flower is very upright and ranging in height from two to five feet. Round-headed Lespedeza is its name, or Lespedeza capitata. It's sometimes called bush clover. This slender plant is covered with a silvery hair to help reduce water loss in the heat of summer. The leaves are clover-like, occurring in groups of three with short stems. The flowers are creamy white with pink near the base and held in densely bristle clusters. Round-headed Lespedeza matures to a dark brown and remains erect even through the winter months. Another slender flower of the upland prairie is rough gay feather or Liatris aspera, sometimes called blazing star. The leaves are short and narrow and increase in size as you move down the stem. The flowers are a deep pink with 25 to 40 rounded bracts per flower head. It is a beautiful sight when you come across a field of rough gay feather in bloom. They will bloom from July to September and usually in the company of one or two species of goldenrod. When entering the prairie edge at midsummer, mixed in with common milkweeds and coneflowers, is another pink blooming favorite, wild bergamot bee balm or Menarda fistulosa. The ragged pom-pom of tubular flowers is easily recognized. Wild bergamot is in the mint family. Typical of mints, it has opposite leaves and a square stem. 
It is sometimes referred to as horse mint because of the definite odor the plant emits that is reminiscent of horses. There are many goldenrods in the prairie, but few are drought tolerant, at least enough to be associated with the upland prairie. Dyer's wheat goldenrod, or Solidago nemoralis, is one that passes the test. Perhaps it's because it is so small and can't compete with the taller varieties of the Messick prairie that it has chose the upland for its home. At any rate, it is well equipped with fine hairs on the stem and its gray-green leaves as well. There are tiny leaflets at the axles of each leaf where it joins the stem. The slender dyer's weed seldom reaches the height of 24 inches and has a one-sided yellow plume that gives it an arching habit. Still another densely fuzzy plant of the dry prairie is woolly verbena, verbena stricta, or sometimes called hoary vervain. The flowers bloom purple halfway down the flower stalk, or sometimes rosy pink. The leaves are thick, coarsely toothed, and almost stalkless. Let's take a look and review the last group of dry prairie plants. There is round-headed Lespedeza, bush clover, or Lespedeza capitata. Rough Gay Feather, Blazing Star, or Liatris Aspera. Wild Bergamot Bee Balm, or Monarda Fistulosa. Dyer's Wee Goldenrod, or Solidigo nemoralis. and woolly verbena, hoary vervain, or verbena stricta.
The furry flora splashes its calendar of colors from the white flowering anemone of June to the blue aster and gentian of October. Hopefully, you will find the opportunity this next summer to experience this glad progression of changing color in the flowers of the upland prairies.